Thank you for tuning in to the Voice of the Victim podcast. We discuss a lot of sad and potentially triggering things on this show. We try to be as sensitive and cautious as possible, but if you are sensitive to things involving abuse and may be triggered, please think twice before listening to our show. There are over 700,000 sexual offenders in the United States alone. With all the social media these days, how can we protect ourselves and our children from these despicable predators? Welcome to the Voice of the Victim podcast, where we discuss criminal cases that involve some factor of abuse. Our goal is to spread awareness of abuse that could be taking place around any of us and encourage everyone to take responsibility and report if they see a child or an adult being abused. Jerry Michael Williams was a hardworking husband and a new father. He had married his high school sweetheart, and they lived together in Tallahassee, Florida. But on December 16, 2000, his family received the unsettling news that he was missing. Later on, they found his truck and his boat, but no sign of Mike. Law enforcement concluded he was eaten by alligators after falling off his boat and getting sucked underwater by his rubber wader pants. But new details kept emerging in this case. Mike's mother Cheryl kept pressing to reopen the investigation, and finally, they did. Welcome to the Voice of the Victim podcast. I'm Rosie. And I'm Ryan. And tonight we are talking about Michael and Denise Williams, part Part two. Oh yeah. Uh, quickly before we start, I want to apologize because Minds of Madness just covered this case in January, which I didn't notice until the morning after we released part one last week. So, I mean, I literally have a queue of about 300 episodes from our podcasting friends to catch up on because between researching and writing for the show and our jobs, we don't get the chance to listen to other podcasts as much as we used to. Of course, they covered this case in a much more thorough and investigative narrative kind of way. So if you've already heard their episode, last week's cliffhanger won't be as exciting for you. But speaking of which, Rosie, (laughs) you ready to get into the rest of the story? Oh, am I ever. All right. When we left off with Brian and Denise, their marriage was having some issues. According to Denise, Brian had been emotionally and physically abusive to her and really controlling over their finances. He had even cheated on her at least once. So at this point, you can't help but feel pity for Denise. She'd lost her husband in some kind of freak accident and hadn't gotten any real closure for it. And then her next husband's abusive and unfaithful. Denise filed for divorce from Brian in 2015, reportedly because of his sex addiction. Whoa. Mm -hmm. That's pretty crazy. Brian fought against the divorce, but he was eventually court-ordered to comply. And he was also required to pay for an appraisal of the couple's home, due by August of 2016. You still say divorce. What? Like three syllables. (laughs) That's all right. How do you say it? Divorce. How do I say it? Divorce. Oh, I'm right. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) Can't argue with that. (laughs) Leave us a comment if you think I'm right. Just to prove a point. Let's not be divisive here. (laughs) Okay. Hashtag Team Rosie. Okay. Okay, continue, please. He had recently learned that his mother was diagnosed with terminal cancer. Also, his son had just decided he wanted to live with his mother full-time, so Brian lost the partial custody he had. And now, he was about to lose his wife. The accumulation of all these things pushed Brian over the edge. Yeah, Brian was in an extremely fragile state here. Uh, Denise didn't want anything to do with him after she'd made this decision to get divorced, so she blocked him on her phone and all other social avenues he could have used to get in touch with her. And he wanted to talk things through and try to change her mind. Hmm. I don't know how I feel about this situation. The sex addiction kind of throws me in for a doozy. Yeah. I know. But they should try to work it out. Yeah. I mean, we don't know all of what was going on in their relationship, so it's hard to really get a grasp on what they were 
all the factors that weighed into her decision, you know, but yeah. Yeah. I'm just looking at it through what I'm reading here Mm -hmm. (laughs) on August 5th of 2016, Denise was about to leave her home in her large SUV. As she started the car, she was making a call to her sister. Suddenly, Someone startled her as they climbed over the center console from the back seat with a gun. She recognized the intruder as her soon-to-be ex-husband, Brian Winchester. She screamed into the phone, hoping her sister had picked it up by now. But Brian grabbed her phone and ended the call before her sister ever answered. Threatening her with his gun, he told her to drive to a remote area so they could talk inconspicuously. Obviously, wow. Yeah, obviously at this point, Denise was freaked out. She couldn't believe he had fallen this far, you know? This is terrifying. But I guess she was able to maintain a cool head, and instead of driving to a remote location where something really bad could have happened, she drove to a CVS pharmacy and parked near the doors knowing there would probably be cameras around. I don't know about you, but a CVS pharmacy is pretty remote these days. <laughs> <laughs> because nobody goes. It's true. Sorry. He told her that he planned on killing himself if she followed through with, with the divorce. Denise was able to eventually calm Brian down by telling him that she still loved him, along with many other people that loved him. She also promised that he that she wouldn't turn him into the police if he let her go. He told her, I lost my son. I lost you. I have nothing to live for. Denise said the situation lasted for about an hour, and near the end, she just calmly asked him, What are you doing? And then it hit him that this was the wrong way to handle the situation. Denise said it was like he kind of woke up and sat back and asked himself, What am I doing? And so this got Brian to back off, and he let her drive him back to his truck and he got out, but it's interesting what he grabbed when he left her truck. Do you like true crime, mysteries, or urban legends, and maybe anything along the lines of weird? If your answer is yes, please give the Asian Madness podcast a go, where I cover all of the topics mentioned above, but from the Asian continent. Podcast is now available on iTunes, Stitcher, Google Play, and wherever you listen to podcasts. He had his gun on him, but also stashed in the back of the truck, he had some kind of tool, a sheet, a tarp, and bleach. Ooh, that's not looking so good. No. It's not very inconspicuous. It sounds like Brian's plans for this encounter were a lot darker than what actually ended up happening, which seems really odd. I mean, to most people in the true crime community, this would seem like a kill kit. So, why would a normal guy that just wants to get back together with his wife need a kill kit? Did you come up with kill kit? No, it's actually, I was listening to the Israel Keys covered uh, premium episode, Gen Y did, mm-hmm. and he placed kill kits all over the country. Mm-hmm. So, that's kind of how that came into my vocabulary. Oh, uh, huh. Why, why do you ask? I hate it. <laughs> well, it's not a good thing, no I matter hate the how word you. Kit. Oh, that's one of those things for you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. What other words do you hate? Um, I can't remember now. I have a weird list. I know, like um, duty. Well, everybody hates that word. No duty, like it's my duty. Yeah, I do hate that word. <laughs> okay, let's move on. <laughs> okay. After seeing this, Denise was spooked. Shortly after she drove away, Brian pulled up to her and apologized for what he'd just done. But that stuff he'd carried away with him had freaked her out. Right away, she called her brother-in-law, asking for advice on how to keep herself and her daughter safe. He told her that she should get a restraining order, and that she should come to the police station right away. He stayed on the phone with her to make sure she'd come. She arrived at the station to give her statement of what had happened, and her accusations led to his arrest. So, at first she was actually surprised that he'd been arrested. Uh, She didn't think he could be in big trouble for what he had just done. And she even stopped cooperating with police for a while. Um, 
but he was charged pretty heavily because he carried a deadly weapon and aimed it at someone, which is a big no-no. Hmm. Yeah. I'm surprised she didn't think that he would get arrested. (laughs) Brian was charged with kidnapping, domestic assault, and armed burglary. These were felony charges, carrying a minimum sentence of 10 years. And Brian was also shocked that this little holdup carried such a huge punishment because, in his mind, he hadn't hurt her physically. Um, But according to her later testimony in court, this was a really traumatic experience for her. Mm. During the trial, Denise talked about how much it spooked her. She was terrorized by her estranged husband, and she told the court that she would never be the same. She said, I would never wish this on anyone. I can't sleep. I can't eat. Because I only see him rising up out of the back of the car. All I feel is the gun shoved in my ribs. I can't have peace because I only hear his voice screaming and cussing at me. Then she pleaded with the court, please, don't let him out. So she is happy that he got arrested. Just surprised her at first. Yeah, that's how it seems. She even read a letter that her teenage daughter from Mike had written, begging the judge to keep Brian in prison. It said, I am scared. My mom is scared. He had a gun. He could have killed her. She is all I have. Please don't let him out. He will come for her, and then I will have no one. Yeah, so that letter really hits you when you hear it. This poor girl had already lost her father and had no idea what happened to him. And then her stepdad kidnapped her mother at gunpoint. I would have been really freaked out about this too. And she doesn't want to lose her only remaining parent. Denise's attorney. No. How do you? John Fuchs. Okay. (laughs) (laughs) I almost messed up royally on that one. (laughs) It's all right. We have bleeps. John Fuchs told the court that Brian was a menacing man who had been lying in wait for Denise. Anne said it would have turned out to be a murder-suicide if not for Denise's smart actions. Denise asked that Brian spend the rest of his life in prison, telling the court, We all have the right to feel secure and safe, and he stole it from me. It comes down to my life or his, and I am asking you to choose mine. Wow, so that's another powerful statement. But I don't know how I feel about him getting life in prison for this. He was in a very fragile state, losing his son and wife and knowing his mother would be dying soon, and he was suffering with suicidal thoughts. But on the other hand, he basically brought a quote-unquote kill kit, TM, for lack of a better term. I didn't come up with it. (laughs) But he had this along with him for the kidnapping, so I gotta assume that he was at least thinking about killing Denise that day. Yeah, I don't know how I feel about it either. Because initially I'm kind of like, well, that's kind of harsh. Mm-hmm. But I do see the, I see all sides on this. Yeah, this whole case as it unravels, I don't know how it sits with me. I don't know if I feel good about the way it ended up, but let's continue because we got a lot to talk about. Okay. Brian pled no contest to these charges. His attorney discussed the events of that day and explained that Brian never meant to hurt Denise. He was trying to get her back together with him. Brian told the court that it was a culmination of all the stress he was dealing with. He said, When I lost my son, that was the nail in my coffin. I wanted to end my life that day. His uncle, sister, and father all spoke in court that day as well, asking for leniency. His son even read a letter he written called A Troubled Man Who Lost His Way. After all these statements... His defense team asked for the minimum mandatory sentence of 10 years. Mm -hmm. And that seems fair to me. I mean, he still gets his punishment. To put it in perspective, uh, this incident lasted one hour, and I did a little math just because I was curious. But 10 years is 87,600 hours. So, I mean, that seems fair to me. But I can't speak for everyone. I just think... He was in a really desperate situation, and he wasn't completely in his right mind. He was dealing with several personal traumas in his life at the time, and his heart was broken on top of it. So even if he had terrible plans, he didn't follow through, thankfully. 
but I'm sure other people who may have experienced what Denise did here might disagree with me and say that a life sentence is fair, but... No, I'm going with your side on this one, Ryan. You think so? Mm-hmm. On the other side, the prosecution wanted Brian to get 45 years in prison. Yeah, before they had said life, but 45 years is basically life for someone in their 40s. So, um, And to p- just put that in perspective, that's 394,200 hours. Ironically, this hearing itself also lasted one hour. Judge James Hankinson met in the middle and sentenced Brian to 20 years, with 15 years of GPS monitored probation after release. Man, that still seems kind of harsh to me. I know, well... But, I don't know, maybe it's completely not harsh. I mean, he did have a deadly weapon and a kill kit, Mm -hmm. so uh, it's a tough... I'm glad I didn't have to make the decision. And as Brian left the courtroom, he mouthed, I love you, to his father, Marcus. Oh, well, that's just really sad. I know. But depending on how you look at this, it could be another clue for what happened to Michael Williams. Brian seems to be a bit of an unstable guy. And he married Michael's wife just five years after his death. So he seems like the perfect suspect in Michael's disappearance. But still, nobody was talking at this point. Denise had even been questioned midway through reporting her kidnapping to police about Michael's disappearance. Her brother-in-law, who worked in law enforcement, came into the interview and told her that he knew she didn't kill Michael, but that she may have been threatened by Brian to stay quiet. She was adamant that he didn't do it, and she knew nothing about it except that her husband went duck hunting one morning and never returned. Yeah, investigators had gotten their hopes up when these charges came up on Brian, thinking maybe this would lead them to more answers about the cold case. But the trial came and went, and not one word about the past was spoken during it. The fuel behind law enforcement's drive to solve Michael's disappearance was the hope and determination of his mother, Cheryl Williams. She was really hoping that these new events would help lead to more answers about what really happened. She also had hope that he was still alive. Aww. Yeah, and sadly, she was alone in, in this hope. No one else in her family believed he could still be alive after 17 years. It's heartbreaking to think about the frustration she was feeling here. After receiving a 20-year sentence for the stupid mistake that he'd made, Brian began to feel hopeless. Yeah, so as you may have guessed by now, Brian had a secret he'd been holding inside for 17 years and he was finally ready to let it out Mm. he did know what had happened to his best friend but he needed a little prodding and deal sweetening from law enforcement to be willing to share all the details law enforcement was in a tough spot here they had to choose between giving brian immunity but finally finding out the truth and closing this case or continuing without the truth The desire for justice for Michael and closure for Cheryl finally drove them to make a deal with Brian. They offered him full immunity to whatever charges may come out of his statement. They were desperate to solve this case, and he'd still get his 20 years in prison no matter what. Yeah, really, that seems like an easy decision. Yeah, but depending on the details that come out, 20 years might be kind of light. Oh. All right. So, we're going to dive into what Brian said happened on December 16th, 2000. But first, we're going to go into more detail about the history of the four friends. The anticipation. Brian and Kathy Winchester and Michael and Denise Williams. You excited, Rosie? I am a little bit. It is a fascinating case. That's why I wanted to cover it, because... If you don't already know the story, it's quite a roller coaster. Brian and Mike went to school together and become really close friends. They kind of lived their lives and went through large life transitions together. They were good friends all the way through college, and they both had their high school sweethearts, who they married around the same time in 1994. The year you were born. The year I was born. What a special time to be alive. (laughs) (laughs) All four of them were devout Christians. They often went on double dates together and Mike and Brian would go hunting and fishing together. 
According to Brian, Mike was a very good friend to him. He seems like he was a really responsible and good dude. But Brian, on the other hand, was not a great husband. He would spend a lot of time away from home, doing his own hobbies and other stupid stuff. He just wasn't there much for his wife. And that's by his own admission. Um, but one day, I guess he was looking through Kathy's purse for some reason, and he found a note inside. And because of this note, he started to suspect that Kathy had been cheating on him with another friend from their high school named Gavin. This crushed Brian, and this is when he started to become a bit more wild. The group of four started going out to bars and concerts a lot, and during this time, they were also drinking a lot. According to Brian, they were making up for lost time in college because they were all pretty straight-laced throughout school and never really partied. The four of them would get hammered and talk about their sex lives with each other. This is when Brian started to feel an attraction to Denise. He had been friends with her since middle school and never felt any attraction to her up until this moment. But this lit a spark in Brian, and he and Denise started to get closer. Oof. Yeah. So, let's switch to Kathy's perspective for a second. One day in December of 1999, Kathy, who is Brian's current wife, got a call from the Tallahassee Police Department. There was an officer standing at a truck that they believed to be Brian's, which was abandoned in the parking lot of a church. This was strange to Kathy because, as far as she knew, Brian was out of town on a hunting trip in Arkansas. Kathy told the officer that it couldn't be his truck, but after identifying multiple bumper stickers, she realized it was his truck. Coincidentally, the church that his truck was parked at was very nearby Centennial Oaks Drive, where their friends Mike and Denise Williams lived. So keep that detail in mind as the story unravels. But now we're going to jump ahead a few months to spring of 2000. Um, this was... You know, roughly eight months before Mike disappeared, the four friends were planning a trip to Panama City for Denise's 30th birthday. The plan was for Mike and Denise to meet Brian and Kathy at their house on Meadow Creek Drive, and they could all ride together from Tallahassee to Panama City. But Mike never showed up. Denise came by herself. And this really bummed Kathy out because she felt really uncomfortable hanging out with just her husband Brian and their friend Denise. Because in person, they were a little too close for Kathy's comfort. And she felt like the third wheel. So she didn't really want to go on a road trip with just the two of them. And it's sad because it seems like there are some real lacks of communication in this marriage. This led to Kathy throwing a bit of a tantrum and yelling, If Mike doesn't have to go... I don't have to go either. Then she ran into the house and locked herself in the bathroom. But Denise and Brian followed her and sat outside the door, trying to talk her into going. She eventually gave in, and the three of them left for Panama City. Okay. They just left him? This wasn't an issue for his wife? I doesn't seem to be. But the locking herself in the bathroom move? Classic. Been there. Uh-huh. But... They just left? It's so yeah. weird. And Denise, Mike's wife, Mike who didn't go, her and Brian stood outside the bathroom door trying to convince Kathy to go without Mike. So Where was, was Mike? Odd. He, I guess he had to work or I don't know where he was, but he wasn't able to go. And What an odd situation. That didn't stop her from wanting to go. But that weekend, the three of them ended up visiting a strip club and getting sloshed in Panama City. And Kathy didn't remember it happening, but later on, she saw a photograph that Brian had taken of her and Denise making out, along with other sexually scandalous photos. So, basically, they had a three-way on that trip, and Kathy had been too, too drunk to really remember. Hmm. That same weekend, Kathy had looked into Brian's wallet, and she found two used movie tickets inside. But she hadn't gone to a movie with Brian. This is when her suspicions of the two of them really started to take hold. She felt like the two of them just kept getting closer, and she was getting pushed out. Yeah, like we said, she was feeling like the third wheel, and there just seemed to be no 
good communication in mm. this marriage, you know? Man, if I found a movie ticket in your wallet and I didn't recognize the movie, <laughs> I know. I would lock myself in the bathroom. <laughs> well, no, I don't think so. I think you'd be punching me. Yeah, I think but so. But that's what I love about you is you talk to me when you're upset and you tell me what's wrong instead of holding it inside, which doesn't ever help. It was a rough situation. We'll just leave it at that. According to Brian, his special relationship with Denise had gone all the way back to October 13th, 1997. Yeah, that was apparently their quote-unquote anniversary date what? that they used when talking about the relationship. So this had been going on quite a while. That night, the four of them had driven together to a nightclub in Tallahassee called Floyd's to see a concert. Wow. Really attractive name for a nightclub. I just... A side note, it's no longer open. <laughs> I, I know why. <laughs> Who wants to go to Floyd's for the night? Uh, uh, apparently these people. <laughs> true. Denise and Brian jumped out of the car at the front door to get in line, and Mike and Kathy stayed in the car to go park. But once the two others pulled away, Brian and Denise had their first kiss. Later that night, after they'd all gone home, Brian and Denise called each other and talked on the phone the whole night. Not a great situation for two married people. They started hooking up during their lunch breaks at hotels and at their homes, whenever they could find an opportunity. <sighs> I'm having a panic attack just thinking about how stressful that would be. It's the perfect way to kill a marriage, having a big secret like that. Well, yeah. I mean, the marriage is already going to be squashed the moment she finds out. But... It's amazing that no one ever did. I mean, this remained a secret for 20 years from this point. 20. That is insane. Mm hmm It really didn't last that long for my parents. <laughs> 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 Mike was a bit of a workaholic, and Kathy wasn't happy about it. So she used to justify... So she used that to justify hooking up with Brian as much as Can possible. Can you... Hold on. Did I just write down the time? Yeah. Okay. Can you just restart that? Mike was a bit of a workaholic, and Kathy wasn't happy about it, so she used that to justify hooking up with Brian as much as possible. And Brian had found out that Kathy was cheating on him in the past. Like we said, she f he found that note, so it was just a big old freaking mess of defiant actions and no communications. It's sad. And scary, but not as scary as what it all led to. So, remember that call that Kathy got from the police about Brian's truck being abandoned in the church parking lot near Denise and Mike's house? And also the huge charges on the credit card we talked about last week Denise had made without talking to Mike? Um, what were those about? Well, it turns out that Denise and Brian had gone on their own little secret trips once in a while. They'd gone off to many places together, like South Beach in New York, Orlando, and Panama City. Did they go to Disney World in Orlando? <laughs> I wonder. That's a good question. One time, Brian had even gone to Panama City to meet up with Denise while Brian was there. <laughs> While Brian was there with her for a work conference. That's really gutsy. I know. And how sad is that, that she is spending Mike's hard-earned money to go on trips with his best friend behind his back. It's so disgusting. This poor guy was working his butt off for her, and she was nailing his best friend on the side. I can't help but feel for him. And, I mean, I've seen a similar situation where my best friend was hooking up with my married sister... And I was the one that busted them, inadvertently. But it would be way harder if it was your best friend and wife. But fortunately for Michael, I don't think he ever really knew what was going on between them. Brian and Denise decided they wanted to be together and get married. But Denise was absolutely determined not to get a divorce. She was a quote-unquote Christian, and divorce wasn't an option for her. Here we see that appearances are much more important to her than actual Christian morals. Brian got an idea for how they could make this happen one day while he was out hunting with Mike. They were walking through a dry lake bed that was full of mud holes, and Mike accidentally 
stepped in one and sank into the mud. Brian had helped him to get out, and Brian realized that if he hadn't been there, Mike would have disappeared and no one would have known what happened to him. Creepy. Yeah. So this is where an idea was hatched. Um, huh. Brian got the idea to stage an accident. That Creepy. way they could get rid of Mike and both come out smelling like a rose. No divorce, no worries. Wow. That's terrifying. <sighs> so that's when Denise and Brian began to plot against Mike. They discussed many ways that they could have gotten rid of him and finally decided on one. Brian was also an insurance salesman and had recently talked to Mike into buying a new $1 million policy through him. So remember last week we discussed how Mike's boss encouraged him to buy as much life insurance as he could. He also had his friend telling him he should buy it, who happened to be a salesman. But before Mike bought this new policy, he'd actually already had a half million dollar policy. He planned to just let that policy lapse on payment and end, so he'd only have one. But with Brian's help, Denise made one more coverage period premium payment on the policy behind Mike's back to extend it past the, di- past the date they planned on enacting their plan. Sorry, there was a lot of peas in a row there. was there. a lot of rough words for old Rosie. Oh, <laughs> you did good. So now Mike's life insurance totaled to $1.5 million, which Denise received after convincing the judge to declare Mike dead after only six months missing. So how sad is that? I mean, Elizabeth Smart was missing for nine months, and people weren't even close to giving up on her. There's a reason they're supposed to wait five years before declaring someone dead without proof. In the weeks leading up to the big plan, Mike would often vent to Brian about his marriage. He was having trust issues with his wife, Denise, noticing her spending money behind his back. And he even confided in Brian that she didn't have sex with him anymore. She would tell him that it was too soon after the birth of their child. This is so sad and sick to me because she was still having sex with Brian at the same time. And during his testimony, Brian said he was glad to know Denise wasn't having sex with Mike anymore. Her husband. He already felt possessive over his best friend's wife. That's so disturbing to me. And I guess that's just my own fears and insecurities coming out. But this terrifies me. Yeah, well, we have a case of it. It's pretty close to home, too. Yeah. The night before the plan went into action... Brian took his wife Kathy out to a concert at Floyd's, the same place he had first kissed Denise. He planned to get her as drunk as possible so she'd be hungover and sleep in late the next day. Wow, that's evil. Yeah. I almost wonder if when they went to Panama City and this time, if they used any kind of roofies or something. Oh, yeah, because of the pictures? Because, yeah, he did admit during the trial that He thought about, they talked about giving her some kind of pills, but he couldn't remember if they actually did. So he didn't want her to notice he was even gone, because he had plans to set up an alibi, which we'll get into in a bit. He also set up plans to go hunting with his father-in-law late that morning. This would also play into his alibi. Denise had a simpler alibi. She'd be at home with her daughter Ansley, and around noon, she'd start calling her family members from the home phone, to establish that she was indeed home at the time of Mike's disappearance. So that brings us to the events of December 16th, 2000, which is the beginning of what we were talking about last week. But let's jump into it. Brian met Mike at a gas station near McDonald's on Thomasville Road and told him about a secret hunting spot he wanted to bring Mike to. He was sure to remind Mike to bring his rubber waders. It was a common belief in the hunting community that if you fell into water with your waders on, you were basically screwed and doomed to drown because they'd suck you under the water. Typically, hunters and fishers would not wear their waders while in a boat because of the high risk, but Brian told Mike he had to wear them the whole time, and Mike trusted his best friend. Brian told Mike they needed to drive separately, and then he turned off his cell phone and told Mike his battery was dead, 
so Mike wouldn't call him and leave evidence of them being together at the same time. They arrived at Lake Seminole and pushed the boat out. Brian sat in back with the motor so he could steer them to the secret spot. At this point, Brian was starting to get pretty nervous because the whole plan was taking a lot longer than he anticipated and he had plans with his father-in-law. He had to get back to town. Brian navigated the boat to a deep area of the lake. He said something was wrong with the motor and the balance of the boat. He told Mike to stand up. Yeah, we should mention this was a tiny boat, like a canoe with a little hand-operated motor, so it was pretty tippy. Mike stood up, looking in the opposite direction of Brian. Brian used the opportunity to sneak up behind Mike, and he pushed him overboard. So Brian planned on pushing Mike in and his waiters taking care of the rest. They were in a deep part of the lake, a good distance from where they launched, so... That was his plan and his hope, but Mike started taking off his waders and jacket and trying to swim to safety. He didn't exactly get sucked under like Brian was hoping. Brian backed the boat away so Mike couldn't grab onto it and tip it. <sighs> what a cold, sinister thing to do, backing away, watching your friend struggle. And by this point, he couldn't turn back because Mike knew that Brian had just pushed him in, and if he did save him, he'd get in trouble for sure. Mike was able to find a dead tree in the water to hold on to. He was panicking, and so was Brian. Then, in an act of desperation, Brian loaded his gun. He circled the boat around Mike twice, getting as close as he could. Then, he took the gun and shot Mike in the head. Oof. Wow. Yeah. And shot his best friend in the head to be with a woman that was willing to have her husband killed. Does that really seem worth it? I don't get it. Mike disappeared underneath the water, and Brian moved the boat closer to where Mike was. He reached under the water, and about at arm's length below the surface, he felt his friend's lifeless body. And Brian said his prominent thought at this moment was, how am I going to explain why my arm is soaking wet? Huh. It's incredible how callous someone can be at a time like this. He grabbed a hold of Mike and pulled him in all the way to a nearby boat landing. He left the body there as he ran to where the vehicles were parked. He drove his large SUV back to where he'd left Mike and backed up to the shoreline. He struggled as he lifted the body into the back of his Suburban. Then he pushed the boat back out into the lake. Brian got into his car and sped back towards Tallahassee, knowing he was going to be late to meet his father-in-law. But he didn't want to call him because he didn't want to leave any phone records in the area. I, I'm, I want to apologize real quick. I just realized that the word back was in that paragraph like a thousand times. So if you were also thinking that, I did notice that, but what can you do? But anyway... I mean, he was pretty smart about not leaving any phone records. Last week, I called the perp a bumblebutt because he planted... Couple times. Yeah, because of the planted evidence that they found later on. But the initial execution of this plan was actually really solid. Solid enough to remain a mystery until he literally told them what happened. And it just doesn't make any sense to me why they planted the evidence later on. That was really stupid. On his trip, he was sitting at a stoplight, and a state trooper actually pulled up next to him. Brian was panicking, because he had a dead body in the back of his car. But then the trooper just drove off. Brian drove back to his home, and on the way, he scanned the parking lot where he planned to meet his father-in-law, and he wasn't there yet. So he returned to his house. When he got home, his wife was still asleep, so he crawled back into bed. Then, from bed... He called his father-in-law to tell him that he'd overslept. He still had a dead body sitting in his car, parked in the driveway of their home, so he really didn't want to wake Kathy, but he wanted her to know that he was there, so he just nudged her so she knew that he was there and started getting out of bed. So somehow he was able to set up this perfect alibi here. As far as Kathy knew, he was just waking up and getting out of bed, and she could confirm that with her father, who thought Brian just overslept. 
Brian went back out to the driveway, and as he walked around his car, he realized there was blood leaking out of the back tailgate and dripping, dripping onto the driveway. Again, in a panic, he took his hose and rinsed it off. I can't believe that. I know. It That's make... like breaking bad stuff right there. <laughs> yeah. It makes you wonder how long it had been leaking out. I'm surprised no one noticed anything like that while he was driving back, especially that state trooper that pulled up next to him. Can you imagine if he would have seen blood leaking out of the back? This would have been a much shorter story. He'll tell you that. <laughs> you tell me that, huh? <laughs> <laughs> Brian mulled over where he was going to dump Mike, trying to think of somewhere close, but secluded enough not to be found. He decided to go to an isolated dirt road with a boat ramp at Carr Lake. Then he drove to Walmart and bought a shovel, a tarp, and some weights. Oh, because that's not suspicious, <laughs> that purchase. <laughs> he planned to weigh down Mike's body in a mud hole. Don't they have to, like, call the police if someone buys a tarp? Weights and a shovel. You'd think there would be some kind of alert when someone buys that combination. Like a sheet of paper of no-no combinations Yeah, that you have to call in. Uh, I don't know. It seems really, really <laughs> suspicious. I was thinking the same thing. Like, no, I'm just making a homemade gym. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> With a tarp <laughs> and a shovel. So back to Brian's little situation here. He was planning to put Mike into a mud hole like he had fallen into before when he first got this idea. And the lake was low enough at this point, but it usually would get higher and cover up the mud holes. So he would be underwater for part of the year if he did hide him there. But like you said, can you imagine seeing someone just walking through Walmart pushing a cart full of these items? No, I can't. I mean, what else could you possibly be doing with these things besides disposing of a body? <laughs> Making a homemade gym, duh. Yeah, I don't know if that <laughs> if that works. <laughs> Brian actually ran into a friend while he was there, but he had forgotten he'd seen the friend until later on, during the search for Mike. The friend told Brian that he'd remembered seeing him at Walmart the day Mike disappeared. And at the time, he noticed Brian was in a panic, but didn't know why. But then he realized Brian was panicked because his best friend had just gone missing. Yeah, it's so sad to see a decent person here giving someone the benefit of the doubt like this, especially knowing what Brian had actually done at this point. The friend just thought Brian was panicking because he was really worried about his friend. But now we know why he was really freaking out. Brian drove to the end of the dirt road at Car Lake and backed his car up to the landing. He laid the tarp on the ground behind the tailgate. Then he pulled Mike down on top of the tarp and wrapped it up. As Brian got eaten up by ants, he dug a hole on the edge of the lake. And while he was digging, another car came down the road, and they drove up and started making small talk with Brian about hunting. Brian was super paranoid, and he even thought this guy may have been law enforcement, like a game warden or something. But then, to his relief, this guy also eventually drove off. If I believed in luck, I would say that Brian is a pretty lucky fellow with how this is going. Is uh, Winchester Irish? No. <laughs> okay. That was a joke. That was weak. <laughs> um, I've heard weaker. <laughs> Brian went back and finished the job, covering up his best friend and taking time to make sure the surface didn't look suspicious in any way. Brian drove to a self-serve car wash with pressure washers and got all the blood off his car. Brian returned home like nothing had happened and slid back into his daily routine with his wife. They had Christmas plans that evening with family, and on the drive back home, Brian got a call from his dad, Marcus, to let him know that Mike was missing. Yeah, like we mentioned last week, Brian was part of that search effort, and he and Marcus were the ones that actually found Mike's truck. About seven months later, in July of 2001, Kathy stumbled upon something suspicious. Among their friend group, Denise had been commonly called the name M Meridian? Yes. I should know that word. I'm ashamed. Why should you know it? Because it's a simple word. Oh, it's not a big deal. Thanks. 
And in late July of 2001, Kathy found a receipt for a custom gold necklace Brian had purchased with the name Meridian on it. <gasps> uh-huh. This was around the same time Denise had Michael declared dead and collected on his life insurance. Hmm. So two months after this is when Kathy filed for divorce on Brian. So by now you're probably realizing Brian's a pretty messed up guy. Um, around this time, before Denise and Brian got married, but after the murder, Brian had actually gone out for his birthday to celebrate with a woman friend. And he wanted Denise to come out that night, but she couldn't find a sitter. Well, later on that night, it didn't really seem to matter to her because she couldn't help herself, and she left her daughter home alone to come surprise Brian. She let herself into his home and walked into his bedroom to find him in bed with the other woman he'd gone out with. <laughs> this was after they murdered someone together. He later told Denise that it was his ex-wife, Kathy, to try to ease the blow, I guess, but it was another random girl. What? Huh. Yeah. But this kind of shows the kind of guy he was. And as we mentioned earlier, infidelity played a huge role in Denise filing for divorce. So we may have never known this story if he hadn't been a cheater. Hmm. After Brian finally shared the truth about this case, 17 years later, the authorities were able to find Mike Williams' body, and his family was able to give him a proper funeral on September 8, 2018 in Tallahassee. Cheryl invited everyone who loved Mike to attend the funeral service. Yeah, Cheryl, oh, this poor mom. It really speaks to what an amazing woman she is. She even welcomed her son's murderer, Brian Winchester, Whoa. to attend the funeral service. Because at some, at one point, he loved Brian, I guess. But uh, I think he was a little tied up at the time. <laughs> but <laughs> it's still such an act of kindness. She seems like a really good woman. Cheryl really wants to have a relationship with her granddaughter, Ansley. They've been estranged for Ansley's whole life because Denise cut ties with Cheryl. Yeah, and remember, Ansley was born, I believe, in 99, so she's, like, she's already pretty old, so she's gone her whole life without her grandma. They didn't really have a relationship, so hopefully, mm -hmm. yeah, hopefully Cheryl will be able to rekindle that relationship, because Ansley's the only thing she has left of her son now. So because Ryan Winchester made a deal with law enforcement, he got full immunity from the charges of the crimes we've just discussed. Ugh. I hate that, Justice. but I'll talk more about it later. But Denise was arrested on May 8th of 2018 while leaving work to go to her daughter's 19th birthday party. She was charged with first-degree murder, conspiracy to commit murder, and accessory after the fact. Her trial was on December 10th to the 14th of 2018, and she was found guilty on all charges. Denise Williams Winchester was sentenced to life in prison. Since this case remained a mystery for such a long time, and a lot of the final outcome is based off Brian's testimony, are there any doubts that he's being 100% honest? Well, the fact that he received full immunity by providing the testimony, he could have had ulterior motives to testifying against Denise. I mean... Think about this. She had personally testified and gotten him put in jail for kidnapping her to try to talk about the relationship. And when she first called her brother-in-law, she wasn't even going to press charges. But then during the trial, she told the court that the incident literally ruined her life. So is it possible she played it up for the trial? I don't know, but she definitely was instrumental in this guilty verdict, so he could have exaggerated her role in this whole thing to get back at her. That is an interesting thought. I mean, he is the one that pulled the trigger. There's no doubt about that. It's impossible to know for sure, but she was just the conspirator. I just don't know if I feel comfortable with him getting complete immunity while she gets life in prison. He's still got 20 years for kidnapping her, but did they just decide that was good enough for him and now let's get her? It seems a bit unbalanced to me. It's almost like saying that if you commit a murder proficiently enough, 
that eventually you can freely discuss it and not be punished. I mean, what kind of precedent does that set? Is it really worth the closure to offer immunity? It's sad because he did seem remorseful during his testimony, but if he really was, would he have needed immunity to actually tell the truth and give this final confession on a murder that he did commit? It's a lot to think about, and it baffles me. That is strange. What if he totally chalked it up just to get back at her? I mean, he could have. Yeah, I think that's very possible. It was brought up that he was physically and emotionally abusive leading up to the divorce. And he did kidnap her at gunpoint. It's possible that she could have been in so much fear that she didn't want to turn him in. Yeah. It's a... It's a weird situation. And I'm not trying to say I don't think Denise was in on it. There was, There's definitely proof that she was. There was a secret informant phone call that Brian's ex-wife Kathy had with Denise where Denise implied that she knew what happened, and so did Brian's father, Marcus, according to her. But um, it's interesting. Police had actually asked Kathy to be an informant like this because she and Denise had remained close friends and talked every day, even after Denise mar- uh, married Brian. Whoa. It's kind of weird. That is, that's weird, actually. Like I said, this is a messy case. But then again, there's a factor that Kathy also cheated on Brian. So, hmm. <sighs> but... I guess there was one more piece of circumstantial evidence that can't be ignored. Denise had paid that other premium for Mike's life insurance policy behind his back, even though he planned on letting it lapse and end after buying his new policy. So when you factor that in, she does seem a lot more guilty. I'm not denying her guilt. It just doesn't feel right to me that she's in prison for life for conspiracy and Mike's actual trigger-pulling murderer is only in for 20 years and not even charged with the murder. It just doesn't sit right with me. It doesn't sit right with me that I don't have a glass of wine while we discuss this complicated and messy case. (laughs) Oh, man. So remember when Brian kidnapped Denise because she was trying to divorce him? During her police interview, she told them some interesting details we left out earlier about their conversation. After he told her that he had nothing to live for after he'd lost, after all he'd lost, she replied to him, You could get us all back if you would just turn back to the Lord. What? (laughs) This this is a ridiculous factor to me, because Denise had told people the reason she married Brian was that he was a good Christian man of God. And I guess into their marriage, he turned away from that aspect of his life. And this was the reason Denise wanted to get a divorce. That's what she said during her police interview after he had kidnapped her. So here's another detail that bugs the crap out of me. Denise was so freaking hypocritical. In 2000, she didn't want to get a divorce for Mike because they were Christian and that would look bad. But then she did get a divorce from Brian because she is a Christian. Not trying to make excuses, but the guy was probably tormented going to church, pretending to be a godly man, knowing that in reality he was a murderer. He was probably disgusted looking at his wife, pretending to be a good Christian woman, knowing that she had conspired for the murder of her first husband. There's no doubt she was a manipulative person, but at the same time, He'd sacrificed his soul for this woman, and she was all he had left. So he wanted to stay with her, but he couldn't be a Christian anymore and pretend his that he was a good person, along with this person that wanted to kill her own husband. It seems obvious, but when you start a relationship with murder, you can't really expect it to be all sunshine and rainbows. Anyway, of course, we don't believe in blaming people for bad things that happen to them, but if you're going to start a marriage with infidelity and murder, you're probably going to reap what you sow. Hmm. Wow. Well, that's all we got for Denise and Michael Williams. <clears throat> yeah. And before we end, we should just reiterate, the big reason this case finally found closure is because of all the hard work Mike's mother, Cheryl Williams, put into spreading awareness of her son's story. 
Yeah. She wrote to the Florida governor daily. She took out ads in the paper and billboards. She never gave up and finally got the answers that she'd been looking for. But sadly, it's not the answer she wanted. She had never given up hope that he was still alive. Yeah, she. I think she had written like 2,600 letters to the governor. The governor was probably like, just do it. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's so sad to see her after the guilty verdict on Denise. Uh, even though these terrible people were finally paying for what they did, Cheryl looked so sad as she left the courtroom. I mean finally accepting that her son was gone for good. And she was truly the person that was impacted the most by this case, as well as Ansley, um, Mike and Denise's daughter. First, she lost her father when she was a year old, and then her whole life she was fed BS from her mother, who knows what. And then on her 19th birthday, her mother was arrested, and Ansley learned what a monster her mother really was. So she lost both of her parents, and... It's such a crappy situation for her. Yeah. Well, so it wasn't the alligators. No, nope, not the gators. Rethink that whole alligator bad mouth stuff. Yeah. Um, I mean, gators do kill people sometimes, but not Mike Not the Williams. nice ones. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, don't judge an alligator before you get to know them. Don't judge an alligator until he bites. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, this is a pretty long episode, so we're going to wrap it up. Mm -hmm. Yes. Don't forget that you can get some Voice of the Victim merch, like T-shirts and stickers, bags, and other things with our logo on them at vovpodcast.threadless.com, which is linked in the show notes. You can also get mugs and stickers, pod cards, and bonus episodes if you sign up for our Patreon, also linked in the show notes, we recently just dis discovered, <laughs> no, <laughs> we recently covered the darker side of Disney as well as, as well as two other cases over there. So go check it out. I can't even talk. I'm so flustered by what happened. Oh, Rosie. And you're pretty tired too. You just got home from work. Yeah. And you had a rough day. Yeah. Oh. You want to talk about it? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Well, you can follow us on Instagram at VOV Podcast and Twitter at VOV Pod and email us at VOV Podcast at gmail.com. All also linked in the show notes. I'll skip the cat news this week because I know you're really tired and this was a long case. Gotta go open that new bottle of wine. Oh, yeah. So, thank you so much for listening and we'll talk to you next week. <laughs>